there's a, a whole, um, whole hoo-ha going on in the guitar world at the moment about sustainable woods. So it turns out that you know, some of the best tone woods in the world are running out, um, and some of them are now on endangered species lists, which means that uh, uh, theoretically it's illegal to take them across borders, uh, display them in public, or sell them without the appropriate documentation, which for rare old guitars you don't have. And um, there have been some stories in the guitar press recently in Germany of people advertising uh, vintage guitars on eBay and the police coming and taking them away. And then apparently what you have to do in that case is also destroy them as well. So there's this whole thing about guitar provenance and should guitars have passports and documentation. One of the interesting things to think about is, again, this question of whether you put electronics into the instrument or whether essentially, you know, we've decorated its surface and, if you like, all of the electronics lives off of the instrument in the device, like in the mobile phone or a tablet or whatever you want to use. And there's, quite, there's an interesting computing question there as to what approach is better. And I think it's got something to do with the relative lifetimes of technologies and sustainability of products. So a guitar is an object that you know, lasts for, you'd hope, many years, possibly decades, possibly a century. Got a hundred year old band. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so it's not clear whether electronics lasts for as long or evolves at the same rate as a guitar. So if you deeply embed the electronics into the instrument, it makes it kind of quite hard to maintain the changes. You know, if in 20 years the electronics has changed, you have to take it all out again and put new stuff. So basically it's platform agnostic? In a sense, or at least the platforms, there's a degree of separation. So in this particular approach, um, you know, the guitar can evolve at its pace to some extent and the phones and the tablets can evolve separately. Um, I'm not saying it's always the right way to do it, but um, I guess it goes back to, there's an interesting piece of work in architecture by an, an architect called Stuart Brand, and he, he wrote about how buildings evolve over time, because you think they're kind of static things, but they're not. And he said there are different layers in a building, I can never remember them all, there were six S's. Uh -huh. There's site and structure and skin and space plan and stuff and the other one. Um, but that they all evolve at different rates and a lot of the tensions in a building are be where those things rub up against each other. You kind of put something in the wall and cover it up and then you need to go back and maintain it. You have to open the wall up. So where's all this leading? Well I think if we're starting to embed digital materials into physical things then that's another kind of layer of evolution. Or in this case we've got a seventh layer stories you might think of. But, but either way, you have to think quite carefully about the rates of change and how, do you, how tightly do you couple those things or how much do you separate them. Yeah, so in terms of how the guitar was made, um, I think we originally had this idea that you know, we deliberately wanted to choose a very traditionally made instrument as quite a provocative statement, I suppose. Uh, and we had this idea that you know, it would be made using traditional methods and that we wouldn't have much impact on that with the digital. But it kind of, I think, turned out we did, but in, in an interesting way. So. Um, uh, Nick Perez Arluthia was quite happy for us to use a laser cutter uh, wherever possible because that kind of saved him work. So we laser etched the patterns uh, into the different surfaces of the guitar. And actually, if you go to the guitar's blog, there's a couple of uh, very exciting videos, a bit like watching paint dry, and it's slightly quicker of watching the laser etching of the front and the back from inside the machine. You can kind of see the view of how it, it works. We also laser etched all the inlay. So this is some kind of uh, this is some kind of early trial leftovers. So this is kind of if you like the inverse pattern that's been laser etched, and then of course it becomes like a jigsaw as you start to fit those into the different parts of the the guitar. So you got a big bag of those. Oh, it smells lovely, by the way. Oh, I smell that. Oh. Mm, yeah, <laughs> kind yeah. of smell of faintly singed wood. It's great. Uh, yeah, and we had to do kind of. I've got loads of other lots of crazy laser etching tests, so we learnt that spruce is a really soft wood, which is why the top's quite hard to make, so here's our initial kind of spruce test etches and so on. Nick was really happy to use these techniques, but it allowed us to stretch the design of the guitar quite a bit, so we ended up with a very ornate front, I think with kind of more knot work, and the sound holes are spread around on this guitar, whereas normally there'd be a kind of big circle in the middle. And that's great. But then that, of course, means how do you get access to the inside of the guitar, which is why we ended up with our removable sound hole on the side. Yeah, the reason we ended up making this somewhat unusual guitar feature is as a result of the design on the front. Um, 
So I think at the end of the day, even though we originally thought that we didn't want the digital in some ways to have much impact, in other ways, just through the process, it probably has kind of quite radically shaped the way the guitar has come out. And I think some of the innovative features come as a result with work, working with laser etchers and you know, with an artist who was doing complex graphic designs in software and then we were mapping them onto the, the structure of the guitar and so on. It was a really interesting challenge for Liz, the graphic designer. She'd worked with the codes before and she'd done you know, lots of patterns and she came up with Celtic Knotwork. But um, mapping them onto a physical object like this gave her lots of other problems. So these, firstly, you have to have the right kind of total area of holes, if you like, in order to let the sound out. So it has to be roughly equivalent to the traditional sound hole. But where you put them really matters, because hidden under the surface here are the braces of the guitar that, that stop it from collapsing. So structurally, of course. We had to give her a sort of digital image of where all the bracing went. And also there are various rules of thumb as it's okay to cut holes here, but you really shouldn't cut holes down here because this is the kind of sensitive and least, you know, kind of stable, if you like, part of the instrument. So a little bit of inlay is okay, but not too much. So, you know, Liz as a kind of designer working in a digital medium had to be really, really aware of the structure of the kind of surface she was working on, which I think is quite interesting. Presumably there's a lot of strength needed to just hold the strings in place. Yeah, I mean, they're under huge pressure. There's a metal truss rod in the back to compensate for the strings and everything's braced and supported so that it, it resonates but doesn't collapse, yeah, and so on. So it's a kind of designing the graphics to fit around that, you know, becomes a quite an interesting task. So there are obviously some decisions that have been made as to what's a hole and what's just, say, darker wood, for instance. Yeah, yeah, and the, and, and the design went back and forth quite a lot of times between Nick and Liz, trying to kind of get the balance between the look and the structure and how thick and thin could we make the lines and, and so and so it went. Yeah, yeah because uh, you're making kind of spaghetti lines like that. <laughs> yeah. There's only so far you can go with wood before. Yeah, and as we found out, it's, you know, it's really hard with the spruce because uh, it is a really kind of soft, delicate wood as well. So we, I think we are pushing the edges of what we could do there. So when will the, uh, the first MP3 be available? Yeah, certainly the plan is, um, I think, from now onwards to kind of get uh, a number of guitarists to play it. And uh, we're certainly uh, up for hearing from volunteers who'd want to come and play it or us to bring it to them if uh, convenient. We're looking for people who want to record songs and have a go. And then eventually, I think, um, once we've built those up on the blog. Uh, I think we'll get it into more public spaces where people can try it out. There are various, there's a guitar mu museum in Sweden I'd really like to visit at some point. So. so two more things I was thinking of asking. Number one, is it finished? Is it actually finished now? Mm. Um, the guitar, the guitar itself I think is, is very nearly finished. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of work. We just want to do actually um, more on some of the standard guitar things called the setup about essentially, you know, getting it to kind of the right sort of playability. So it just needs a little bit done, but pretty much there, certainly playable now. The project itself, of course, is nowhere near finished. It's really just beginning because it's all about kind of capturing this history. And so, you know, we really hope people take a look at the blog and follow the story as people start to play it. Uh, the only other thing is the guitars evolve over time as well. They settle down, they reshape, they get battered, so it may sustain damage and we may have to adjust the mappings and all sorts of other things, yeah. So, so I doubt it's finished. I was going to say the other thing was, be, is this the first of many, will there be more? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind making some more guitars. I'd wondered about making a, a sort of an, an electric that maybe tried out some of the embedded electronics approach um, as a kind of contrast. And in conversations with our uh, a really interesting researcher called Andrew McPherson at Queen Mary about a possible piano as he's, he's come up with a beautiful way of sensing how people touch the keys on a piano using kind of capacitance sensing.